It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large, 60 minutes of smart talk radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis, from the flight deck as always. And of course, that means some smart talk radio is in your future. And this segment will be an interesting one indeed. We're going to be talking to Jake Bernstein. He is a senior, or was a senior reporter rather, on the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists team that broke the Panama Papers story in 2017 that Project won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting. He earned his first Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2011 for coverage of the financial crisis. He's also written for the Washington Post, Bloomberg, The Guardian, et cetera, et cetera. He's appeared on CNN, PBS, NPR, NBC, on and on. He was the editor of the Texas Observer and his co-author of Vice, Dick Cheney and the Hijacking of the American Presidency. We're pleased to have him here. Jake, uh, how are you, my friend? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me, Warner. Well, we're pleased to have you here. We have not talked at all, ever, on this show about the Panama Papers. Brand new work you've got out called Secrecy World. Let's do this. Let's, uh, Jake, if you would, refresh the memories of our Lewis at Large listeners about the Panama Papers as that story exploded across the globe. Absolutely. Well, the Panama Papers came out in April 2016. That's when the first stories were dropped. It was a leak of documents, more than 11.5 million in total, that were released by journalists all over the world, pretty much in every continent, and more than, I think, 340 journalists worked on the project. These were files from a Panamanian law firm. It was one of the top five law firms in the world creating anonymous shell companies. And through the files, we were able to see presidents and prime ministers, drug traffickers, the uber wealthy from multiple countries, and really got to see in a macro way how this secret economy actually works. What was it about this particular release, and, and how, how were they able to break through this veil, so to speak, after undoubtedly this going on for so long? Well, it all begins with a German newspaper called Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is based in Munich. One of the reporters there gets contacted by an anonymous source who asks him if he's interested in data. And then the data starts coming and coming and coming and coming and ends up being 2.6 terabytes worth of information, which was unprecedented at the time. And Süddeutsche quickly realized that there was there was information here that that really covered all over the all over the world. There weren't actually a lot of German politicians, oddly enough, and that they needed to collaborate with other media in other places. And the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists had done that kind of collaboration before, multiple times over many years, including stuff about the offshore system. And so they were the perfect partner for this. And ICIJ, this consortium, uh, managed to make the data searchable, which in and of itself was this mammoth task, and then set up this secret kind of Facebook for all of us journalists to collaborate and talk about what we're finding and share our findings and add to them until we had sort of come up with some of the best finds. And I say some because they're still finding stuff. I mean, this is 11.5 million documents. And that's really sort of how it came about. So let me just ask you in in general, just from a 100,000-foot view, these are investments made or monies deposited offshore by a variety of people, a variety of wealthy people and possibly government people around the world into secret accounts and secret investments, and therefore it's it's hidden from taxing authorities, et cetera? Or tell us exactly what is the purpose of these things and why are they set up to begin with? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, there are, are all kinds of reasons why you might want an anonymous shell company, and some of them can be completely legitimate. For example, you want to do some business and you want to keep it from your other business partners. Or this is sort of less legitimate, but certainly not illegal. You have a mistress, and you don't want your wife knowing about the fact that you're buying her an apartment. So you set up an anonymous shell company, and the shell company belongs to the mistress, and the mistress buys the apartment with it. So there's all kinds of reasons why you might want something like this. The the question is, are you reporting this to the proper authorities so that, that if it's taxable income, 
you're paying your taxes on it. That's, that's where the tax evasion and tax avoidance uh, issue sort of comes in. But basically, this is all about keeping your financial activity secret. And with an anonymous company, you can do anything. You can buy an apartment. You can set up a bank account. You can do any sort of financial activity that you can possibly imagine. And these have been around for a long, long time. What Mossack Fonseca, which was the Panamanian law firm behind the Panama Papers, what they really did was they had this sort of McDonald's approach to the business. You know, it was high volume, low cost, and they spread out literally hundreds of thousands of companies all over the world. And they hit it at the perfect time because it was a time where, you know, the Internet is sort of coming to the fore. You have a, a growing middle class in the developing world. There's a great market for this, and there's an ability to do this kind of business on a wide scale. And that's what they really do. And, and so something that previously had only been available to the uber-wealthy becomes accessible to the merely rich. So a big part of the story here is that this does, instead of just being an offshore account, which is almost a cliche anymore, this now becomes more accessible, not necessarily to the average guy, but to the wealthy average guy versus the uber wealthy. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And the really smart people, they don't just stop at an offshore company, right? You have an anonymous company, but you might, it might, it might actually begin with a trust. And the trust owns a company or the trust is connected to a foundation which in turn owns a company. I mean, you paper it with layers and layers of entities so that uh, you get your, your maximum uh, concealability. So it begs the question, then, once a story like this breaks, journalists like yourself are obviously all over it, and I would assume all kinds of governments and taxing authorities and therefore also law enforcement authorities become a part of this and becomes almost a world, the world knows about it, countries know about it, law enforcement knows about it. So what's the reaction when these stories come out? And that's exactly right, Warner. I mean, there's, the, the reaction was, was, like, was frankly seismic. You know, and it's still playing out. So in Pakistan, for example, the president of Pakistan, the Supreme Court made him step down because his family had offshore companies that were holding real estate in London, you know, very high priced real estate in London that he couldn't quite explain where the money was coming from. That's just sort of one example. The prime minister in Iceland also had to step down. Literally hundreds of investigations by criminal authorities, the prosecutors around the world, Interpol and others, have been launched because of this. Meanwhile, in Panama, there are multiple investigations concerning this law firm underway. There's been, there's been lots of sort of political and criminal ramifications from the publication of this, but it's also allowed people to sort of see in a macro way, you know, how this underground economy through which trillions of dollars flows actually works. If you just joined us, yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. Got a good one going here. We're talking to Jake Bernstein. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, investigative journalist. You've seen his work in a variety of publications. You've seen him on television from CNN to PBS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A brand new work called Secrecy World, Inside the Panama Papers Investigation of Illicit Money Networks and the Global Elite. Okay, so a side story out of this, and maybe it's not a side story. You tell us how important this is. There is a question here of how the Panama Papers actually charts in a maybe an indirect way the rise of Vladimir Putin. Share uh, some of those observations with us, if you would. What was extraordinary about these documents is that we saw really for the first time a whole network of companies that were surrounding Vladimir Putin and his closest uh, collaborators, you know, oligarchs who had become outrageously rich billionaires because of Vladimir Putin, and who had risen up with him. And we found one person in particular that was quite astounding. This is one of Vladimir Putin's oldest friends. It is the godfather of his oldest daughter. And he's a musician, a, a classical cellist by the name of Sergei Rodulgin. This is a man who, before this, never had any business connections. Nobody ever talked about him in regards to financial activities or business. I mean, he literally was a classical cellist who was known as Vladimir Putin's old friend. And reporters would go to him and ask for sort of insights into what Putin was like as a young man, because they used to cruise the streets of St. Petersburg, you know, in Sergei Rodugin's Lada, 
uh, you know, drinking and getting into fights in their early 20s. So what we found was that Roldugan was the secret owner of several of these Panamanian shell companies created by this Panamanian law firm, and that these companies were doing incredible stuff. They were, you know, maneuvering to take over Russia's largest car uh, truck manufacturer. They were involved in transactions with Russian state banks and Billions of dollars were flowing through this network of companies. And nobody had ever seen any of this before or even thought that this cellist was this kind of, you know, financial savant. And what seems clear is that he was a proxy owner, a proxy owner for someone else. There has been much discussion over time that Vladimir Putin is, in fact, a, a multi-billionaire. He might be one of the richest people on the planet. But nobody has ever actually been able to, to see his wealth or calculate this activity. And that's probably because it, is, it flows through the secrecy world. And the Panama Papers allowed for the first time a real look into how this operates. Jack, this also begs the question, you've talked about the leaders in Pakistan. We've talked about Vladimir Putin. It, again, it makes us think, tell us about anybody well-known or actually not well-known uh, from the United States. Anybody from the United States involved with this? This is not exclusive to other countries. You know, this is one of the, the, the popular misconceptions that, that I, I really try to explain in, in my book, Secrecy World. You know, the U.S. is one of the biggest players in this business. Delaware is pumping out, you know, more than they're making more than a billion dollars a year from their business registry. And that is offshore companies. I mean, well, offshore, it's, it's Delaware, but they're anonymous shell companies and they're selling them all over the place. And they're selling them to Russian criminal gangs, you know, and other sort of sketchy people. And, there's, and nobody knows who's behind these companies. It's completely secret. And it's not just Delaware. It's Nevada. It's Wyoming. It's a number of different countries. And one of the stories that I talk about in Secrecy World is about bear shares. Bear shares are these amazing things. They're, they're actual pieces of paper, certificates. And whoever has the certificate owns the company. And so governments hate these things because they're perfect for money laundering, right? You're the, the company owns real estate or it owns a bank account or whatever, and all I have to do is give you the piece of paper, and suddenly you own all those things, and it's completely untraceable. So governments have been clamping down on this, and even tax havens have been backing away from them. They've been prohibiting them, or they put them under custodianship, where the piece of paper, the certificate, has to be in a safe with a lawyer or a banker, and the banker or the lawyer has to know who actually owns the certificate. So you can see in the Panama Papers how this thing is sort of like a, a living organism. It, it evolves over time. And so the British Virgin Islands sort of outlaws or restricts bear shares. And then you can see Panama, which still allows them, there's a skyrocketing in offshore incorporations, in, in company incorporations, because people want these bear shares, and so they're going to Panama. Well, today, there are only two jurisdictions in the world that offer these certificates, that offer bear share ownership of companies. They're the Marshall Islands and Liberia. You know where the public registries of the Marshall Islands and Liberia are based? <laughs> Not in the Marshall Islands or Liberia. They're based in Virginia and New York City. Sure. They're sure. based, at, you said, would you say New York and Virginia? Yes. Okay. Is that, in fact, against U.S. or state law? No. No, so what it, you, when it, you're it, saying these states are involved, somebody, their secretary of state or whoever is doing somebody at a government agency somewhere has the authority to participate in all this. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And you put your finger on it with the secretaries of state because they're the ones who have lobbied fiercely over the years to make all of this stuff permissible and as non-transparent as possible so that they can continue to rake in the funds from creating these companies. Why have we not heard more about this? This is it's very surprising. I mean, that's why we're pleased to have you here. But has this come out before and we just turned our back on it? I think some of that is true, right? Some of it is that a lot of these companies, these certainly these Delaware companies and Wyoming companies, Nevada companies, are being marketed to foreigners. So foreign governments have been complaining loudly and vociferously, but that hasn't actually made it to American ears. 
right? So that's part of it. And part of it is that these, this, this stuff is so secret that it's only from these big leak investigations that we can get a macro view of it and really start to see it. I mean, ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, just came out with another leak investigation recently, uh, right around the time that my book Secrecy World came out. This involved a, a law firm called Appleby, which is based in Bermuda. This one actually had a lot more Americans. They had about 31 thousand American clients, this uh, Appleby, a lot of these people were, were doing the same thing. They were going offshore to keep their activities secret. Some presumably were not reporting this to the federal government and they were involved in tax evasion. And some were corporations like Nike or Apple. And they were, this was all vetted through lawyers and it was just tax avoidance. But the tax avoidance, I mean, this is states by one estimate loses seventy billion dollars a year in tax revenue from shifting corporate profits to tax aid. All right, Jake, let me ask you something. Take the other side for just a second. Take the side of the state. Let's just say the state of Delaware. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute here. Well, just because we're offering this doesn't mean, A, number one, it's not illegal. And B, just because we're offering this doesn't mean that the people that are that invest with us and are we're related to here are doing something illegal. It's just another opportunity. Can you make that argument? You know, this, well, this one, one of the wonderful things about my book, Secrecy World, is that for the first time, the, the people behind this, this law firm that had gotten hacked, Mossack Fonseca, the two principals, a gentleman named Jurgen uh, Mossack and uh, Ramon Fonseca, and they were their law firm. Mossack Fonseca was the law firm that was you know, where, where the leaked documents came from. And they both spoke to me at length. And this is exactly the argument that they make. You know, they say, first of all, they do not believe that they are selling secrecy. They argue that they are selling privacy and that there's a big difference between secrecy and privacy, although when you try to get them to explain that, it breaks down a little bit, of course. But the other thing that they're saying is we just sell these companies. We sell these companies to lawyers who then sell them to their, give them to their clients, or we sell them to bankers or to accountants. We're doing what corporations and lots of other people do, and we should not be held responsible for where these companies end up or for what people actually do with them. And they say, we're like a car dealership. You know, we sell you the car and you drive it off the lot. And then if you are involved in a horrible drunken accident while driving that car, well, that's on you. That's, that's not on us for selling you the car. This argument has some validity for sure. But there's also questions about transparency and about rules. You know, increasingly, governments have tried to put rules on this, this system, this offshore system, you know, making people... Uh, responsible for vetting who actually gets these companies and what they're doing with, him, with them. And, uh, and those rules are, are not being followed, and the, not particularly well, at least. And there isn't a lot of enforcement. And so these big leak investigations are, are really kind of forcing people to see that in some ways the system is broken down. What about someone says Jake Bernstein goes into his bank and opens up another bank account and he has his, his, his primary bank account is with his wife. He opens up one by himself. Do we assume, A, Jake is hiding something? He just wants an extra account? Do you see what I'm saying? And, I, and by the way, I understand exactly what your point is, and I think I, I fully agree with, with a lot of the things that you've been talking about here. But I could see how someone could make that point. Look, what we're doing, we're just providing opportunity. What they do with it is up to them. Again, I can open up as many bank accounts as I want, right? And right. I can open up bank accounts abroad. But I have to report those to the federal government. You know, so that when it comes time to pay my taxes, I, I have to pay my taxes, right? And I have to tell the, the government, you know, the money I have and pay what I owe, right? And obviously, uh, you know, I will, as every, as the right of every American, I will try to pay as little as possible. And that all of that is understandable, right? And there's nothing wrong with it. But if I'm using an offshore company to pretend that I have less money than I than, than I actually do, so I don't have to pay as much taxes. I'm not actually reporting what I'm supposed to reporting. Or heaven forbid, if I'm using an offshore company to in, engage in illegal activity, to launder money, or to hide things in other ways, well, then that, yeah, becomes a problem. That's when sort of society breaks down. And the larger story here is that at some level, this offshore system has allowed a global elite, you know, the uber wealthy, right. to avoid paying taxes and to avoid contributing to society. So 
the things that we have to do, that you and I have to do, Warner, you know, the taxes that we have to pay and, you know, the obligations we have as citizens of the United States of America, these people are not obligated by that in the same way because they can avail themselves of this system and avoid paying taxes. And again, you're listening to Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis, as always, from the flight deck. Uh, got a good one going here with Jake Bernstein, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist, a brand new work called Secrecy World, all about the uh, inside the Panama Papers investigation of illicit money networks and the global elite. Jake, let's prognosticate just a little bit. We're sort of in the throes of all of this now. How does this go out three to five years from now? Has this thing been sort of, quote, resolved? And has it played itself out? And, and what is that? What is the future look like for these various networks? It's a really good question. One of the things that we have seen is because of these leak investigations, partly because of these leak investigations, and, and particularly because of citizens in, in Europe and, and in other places, you know, demanding that uh, that there be fairness and, uh, you know, that, that, that people pay their fair share and, and what they're supposed to pay. Um, you see a tightening up in certain places. So there is more vetting in places like the British Virgin Islands and traditional tax havens. And some of those tax havens might even, you know, end up being closed down, you know, not behaving in quite the way that it behaved. The system is very resilient. And so you'll see it move to places that are more opaque, places like Dubai or Singapore, other places like that. The other thing is this experiment of Mossack Fonseca, the Panamanian law firm, to make this available to the merely rich. That's starting to change also. Now it's going to be increasingly really only available to the uber wealthy. But it's not going away. Global inequality, which as we know is increasing, I think will just make it more profitable. You know, people are not going to, they're going to continue to use this system and, uh, and they're going to, going to continue to push the boundaries. I mean, the wealthiest 1% of American households own 40% of the country's wealth, and they can avail themselves of the system to pay as little taxes as possible, and they will continue to do so. Boy, for an investigative journalist like yourself, this must have felt Watergate-ish if not larger, in terms of this gigantic leak. Was this like a big circus to you? Was this like, uh, oh my gosh, I've hit the mother load? Tell us about that. It was like being a kid in a candy store. I will not lie to you. We had a good nine months or so of just combing through the data and looking for things. And so IPIJ had set up this sort of secret, you know, Facebook-like thing where you know, 100-plus journalists from all over the world could share their findings and go through it together and it was just amazing. I mean, you would find one world leader and you'd throw that person up onto the little area of the Facebook thing where people were talking about that country or that world leader. And, and someone else would find something and add to it. And then you, go, you would find a court case that related directly to this company, you know, that was further proof of what was going on. And it was just wonderful. I mean, it was, it was, it was great fun, you know, just sort of putting together this massive jigsaw puzzle. And then everyone who was involved really felt like, you know, this is in the public interest, that it is important for the public to know that this is going on and that uh, people are using this system and that political leaders are using this system. And so it was a wonderful time. And then when the publication happened, it was, I was talking with, with Jurgen Mosak, one of the, the lawyers, uh, the founders of, of the law firm, and, to, and he said to me that he, he didn't fully realize what had happened to his firm until he turned on the TV and his life's work was on every single channel. It was just inescapable because it was, you know, 340 journalists publishing all over the world. And so it was everywhere. And, uh, and it was quite an experience. Well, it is a fascinating work called Secrecy World, Inside the Panama Papers Investigation of Illicit Money Networks and the Global Elite by Jake Bernstein, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist. Indeed, Jake, uh, before we get out of here, how can people pick up a copy of the book and also check out some of the other work that you've done in the past? Well, thank you so much. It, it, my website is jakebernstein.net, so they can go there. Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon at Barnes and Nobles. I believe it's at Walmart. Anywhere that you, where there's a bookseller, should have a copy. And if they don't, you can certainly ask them to order it. Well, we appreciate you very much. Your insights and bringing this story to us, and would love to have you on again sometime. Great. Well, thank you so much, Warner. I really appreciate it. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. This is Katie Terry with Call of Duty Pet Waste Removal. You're at work, running errands, or away on business, while well, your dog does their business too. Most times in your yard. 
For quick, expert cleanup of those special presents your dog left behind, call Call of Duty, 764-7224. We do all the cleanup for you on a one-time or on an ongoing basis. So when your dog does their business in your yard, call our business, Call of Duty, 764-7224, or visit our website, callofdutypetwasteremoval.com. 